Thanks everyone for coming tonight. Um, we have another, well, hopefully relatively exciting topic for tonight. At least anyone who is dealing with Python will stumble across that at some stage. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about Python virtual environments and the subtitle is basically how not to stuff up things. Um, first question is why would you even do that? Well, when you're dealing with different projects, it's most likely the case that you will have dependencies and different projects will have different dependencies. So certain projects, especially if you're dealing with legacy projects, uh, they won't necessarily, necessarily work with newer versions of dependencies. So you have to be careful what you're actually dealing with. It's also the case when you're actually trying to see whether your application works with newer versions of certain libraries. And it's quite handy having another virtual environment where you can basically test it with different versions, where it breaks and which ones work and whatnot. Thirdly, you can basically isolate your host system. That's one of the lessons that I actually learned uh, the hard way, way, way back. I think there was still Python 2.4 back then. And a lot of things on my Linux box back then were running Python for for the distro and I needed a newer version so I upgraded um, my library back then and then pretty much nothing worked anymore I needed to reinstall that system so there was a lesson learned that well don't touch your host system ever let that done let that sort of like only be done by your um, distro itself because they have done the testing for you and they can at least um, then you can blame it on someone else too and one of the biggest things is I find as well that quite often by having to test so much to make sure that every everything works across like thousands of packages those system libraries um, that your distro provides you with are quite often outdated for Python libraries and especially if you look like at things like NumPy and whatnot they bring out a new version I don't know every month or so um, so if you installed something last year, it will be terribly out of date uh, with functionality. I mean, for most, for a lot of applications, you probably don't have to be at the bleeding edge, but yeah, it can still happen. How you do that? Well, I'm going to talk about three approaches. There, there's plenty more. I mean, we're talking Python, so there's, um, if there's, 10 ways of doing it. There's at least 217 uh, libraries for doing it. And we'll just start with probably, at least to me, the most common ones. Uh, one, the first one is the VNV, the virtual environment module that comes with Python. There's virtual env, one that I've actually used for, oh, I don't know how many years. Um, and there's Anaconda, which I used to use when I was actually, or when I had to do something on Windows. Cool. So with the virtual environment module that comes with Python, it um, showed up in Python in version 3.5, currently we have version 3.10. It is a built-in module, I mean, following the slogan of batteries included. Um, but if you're actually on Ubuntu, for instance, then you actually have to install a separate uh, module Python 3 VN, for instance. And one of the limitations that the VN module has, you need to install it for that particular version of Python that you're using. So um, <clears throat> the Python 3 is probably just an alias for Python 3.7 or 3.8, whatever is the default Python version on your distro. So it will only be available for that particular Python version. And um, so if you need another Python version, then you need sort of like to install that particular um, package then for that as well. On the command line, that's actually really, really easy. So Python 3, the interpreter, use dash m for, ex for executing a module, the vnv module, and then uh, the vnv path, that's sort of the directory where you want to put your virtual environment into. So pretty straightforward and quite easy to do. So here's a little example. If, as 
from I didn't bother recreating that particular, so it's still using 3.7, an old one, doesn't really matter. So in that case, I use 3.7 that I want to create the virtual environment for and call it VN37 as well. Up here, and then in the second line, I activate it, and you can see that I'm using a dot, or I could have also written out source and then bash the dot is this equivalent to that. And then in the VN37 directory, in the bin directory, there's an activate script, which is source, and then you end up with a little prefix, VN37, so you actually know that you're in a certain virtual environment. And then you can basically use pip, python and whatnot without having to use a suffix of 3 or 3.7 because it will find these executables first before it goes onto the system. And by executing, for instance, pip freeze, you can see there's actually not much in there. It's just one particular package, the package resources one. And for instance, you can then install a package, for instance, numpy via pip install, grabs it, and then stores it, and then cool. Then you can basically run pip freeze again and would output a few more things then, all the dependencies of NumPy then as well. And then once you're done with a particular environment, you can just basically then just enter deactivate and execute that, and that basically um, <clears throat> reverts all the various uh, environment variables that were set and also um, you PS1 environment variable will disappear here and it's basically back to fragpit and the end then. So very straightforward, nothing really to it. Virtual env, which has been around for quite a while. I'm actually not sure. I think it actually predates the VN module by quite a bit. Um, it is the way, at least according to the authors, is more powerful, it's faster, it's extendable. And it can also use any Python version, at least when you're using it um, on the Linux box where I'm using it. So you can just um, give it a Python interpreter that you would like to do. On the Debian system, you basically just um, do sudo apt-get install virtual env. It gives you that. In Windows, um, I just found out they can actually do a pip install virtual env now. We couldn't do in the past uh, because it wasn't actually on uh, PyPy. But it's similar then in that case because you're installing it through pip. It's then once again tied to that particular Python version that you're using. And on other operating systems, um, the virtual env guys have in their documentation various approaches how you can do it. And one of them is pipx as well, which I'm going to just briefly touch upon uh, later on in my talk as well. So command line looks a little bit different. So I have my virtual env executable. Minus p is basically the Python interpreter that I want to use. So it could be slash user slash bin slash Python 3.7. And then the same like with the vnf module, I also basically provide a path where I want to have the virtual environment installed. Same example again. This time we're using virtual env. And um, this time I'm giving it a virtual env 37 directory. Same thing with the activating, um, sourcing that. Um, and then you can see the different prefix. And same here, pip freeze, same output. I can also install NumPy in that virtual environment. And then do things that I want to do and need to do in my virtual environment. And then same thing with deactivate to revert basically the same and go back into my regular shell. Otherwise, you can also just exit your shell completely, and that solves the problem too. Anaconda, that's a completely different beast. Whereas the other two were rather lightweight. Um, so Anaconda on gets advertised on the website as world's most popular open source Python distribution platform. And for a long time, it was actually the best option under Windows. Uh, excuse me, I have to let a little dog out. That's the kind of interruptions that you get when you have an online meeting. Um, and it's big. So 
The download that I downloaded um, just today was 522 megabytes for Windows. Um, might could be a bit smaller on the Linux. Um, if you're running it on, on Linux, it, it, it fiddles with your bash RC file, something I don't actually like very much. Um, they basically did then sort of like activation and all these things in there. So you can use an anaconda through there. Um, the good thing was for Windows, because they have their own software channels, so similar to like PyPy, um, so they basically compile things for you, so you don't have the problem in setting up a build environment under Windows, which used to be quite a big pain in the butt, um, but that made that a lot more accessible for people under Windows. And also, only if you use their channels, can you sort of like clone the environment. So if you have a working environment, you want to create something, the same environment, but for testing some things, for instance, upgrading some libraries and whatnot, then that only works if you actually went through their channels because PIP, which you can use, sidesteps the whole thing. So you basically use their Conda tool, which manages environments. Um, for instance, here, conda create minus n for name. So you give it an environment name, and then you basically say, oh, that's actually a typo in here. Uh, Python equals 3.7, for instance, and then it installs a virtual environment for 3.7. Is it really necessary nowadays still? Potentially. Um, it has gotten a lot better over the years. So a lot of um, libraries nowadays also upload platform specific wheel files to PyPy. So not just the sources, which you actually had to compile then on your particular platform and for the various Python version that you have. So that's gotten a lot better. Um, I actually had trouble finding sort of like <laughs> um, a library that I could show sort of like the compilation with. Um, and most of them actually had wheel files, so it was quite different to a few years ago. And one thing that I used in the past was from the University of California in Irvine. Um, this particular guy had a lot of Python libraries, mostly scientific ones, pre-compiled. So it's 563 different packages where he, he or she provides binary downloads for different Python versions, for different architectures for download, which was actually really, really helpful when you actually wanted to sidestep having like a 500 megabyte download and then install of several gigabytes so that you can run a library um, that only requires one binary uh, library of uh, five megabytes. So it could sometimes be a bit overkill using Anaconda. I mean, now with the Windows, subs Windows subsystem for Linux, it's also the question, why go through all that trouble? You could just, since you're just installing gigabytes anyway, you might as well just install a proper Linux distro and then go through there and you don't have any of those problems. There's plenty of things, how you can do things nowadays. So here's, once again, the same example. Um, Conda, create, I'm giving it a name, and here's correct, Python version equals 3.7. You can also then, in theory, already list all the kind of packages that you want to install there as well. Um, has a whole lot of, it asks you a few more questions, uh, it will update its channels, uh, install things and whatnot, so there's a whole lot of other things happening here, and takes also quite a while. And then you can, by using Conda, you basically activate your environment, and then same thing, you also see it then in the front there, um, in which environment you are. And then when you do pip freeze, then you see there's actually other things installed in there. And when you install NumPy or with pip or with conda, so it's pretty much the same. So you just swap out pip for conda, and then you can install that. And then you can still do a pip freeze to see actually what libraries they installed. And then rather than just calling deactivate, you call conda deactivate. Just hold on a sec. I don't think so that my neighbors appreciate having a Python talk going on. So, yeah. 
So that's basically Anaconda as a quick example for Python on Windows. So if you don't want to use Anaconda, I was farting around with that for quite a while today. Things that worked in the past no longer work as it is the case with Windows. Because I think back then it was still Windows 8 that I was dealing with and Windows 10, Windows 10 and whatnot seems to be behaving once again different and builds fall over. Um, so rather than installing a full blown version of Visual Studio, because of, whereas on like a Debian system, you can just um, install sudo apt-get build essential and off you go. Um, and then the Python headers and something, and that's it. Um, you actually have to go through like a C++ compiler and at least Microsoft offers what they call build tools. And there's different versions out there for 2017, 19 or 22. And you can basically install those that allow you to have like a compiler chain that you can actually like CMake and whatnot, that you can actually compile libraries that are only available in source code on your Windows system. And yeah, well, so you basically then just after installing the build tools, you can install, download and install Python from python.org. If you shouldn't have pip, depending on the version, so at some stage you started including pip as well, um, you can always grab it basically from here, bootstrap piper io, and then execute that, and that basically will download pip and install it in your particular um, Python version then. But even having those particular build tools installed, it really depends on the library itself. If it still relies on other like header files and things like that, so you might have to then include those then as well, and then it gets a little bit hairy and, and fiddly. So depending on what you're dealing with, you might want to go back then once again um, to Anaconda if, if you can't find real files and whatnot. So personally, I would just probably always try the lean way of not going through Anaconda and um, see whether you can just get away with a lean Python install because it's just a lot smaller and faster installing in the web way and see where you can set things up. Right, okay. Um, so I have a few virtual environments set up. All right. And I'll be sharing my screen for that. Right. Okay, first thing we're just going to start with a an Ubuntu system. Oops. Um, uh, oh, this create a temp directory where I'm going to do something. So, what do I have installed? Ah, uh, three point eight. Let's have a look. What version that is? Three eight ten. It seems quite relatively decent. So I can then basically use my Python 3 um, with the VNF module and then create a directory. Okay. So if we're looking into that, there's a whole bunch of th things in there. So you find setup tools and we just go into um, site package to see what we've got in there. So we have pip, we have the packages, resources and setup tools that we have in here. Um, so if we look in there, I have the bin directory. Yep, so you can find pip. So just for convenience, you also have pip3 and pip38 in there. They basically just all point to the same thing. And then you have Python and Python 3. So it's quite handy. So we can basically source that in here. Uh, we activate that and you can see we are now in our virtual environment. Create. <clears throat> and if I now just call a Python version, I get 3.8.10. Very cool. 
So if I wanted to, I can deactivate that again, and I could actually um, store Python 3.7 here quickly. Um, actually, Python 3.7, 3.7, store it quickly. So I'm using a different PPA for installing other versions there. So it's called Dead Snakes, uh, which is quite handy. So that lovely person makes lots of different versions of uh, Python available. So it makes it really easy to um, install missing Python versions once you upgrade your operating system between like major releases and all of a sudden the one that everything was developed on has disappeared. Uh, can be a bit painful, so that's quite helpful in installing these versions. So, going out again, so I can then also quickly um, install one for another one. So we now have two. One thing that I really like about the virtual environments, I don't actually have to activate them. So what I can do, I can basically just, for instance, call pip or python out of my bin directory in there, and everything just works just as is. Nothing in there. So I can, for instance, install numpy in here with 3.7. Do a pip freeze and I see NumPy is installed. And if I look at my 3.8, yep, still nothing in there. And then I can um, install something else there. I see that basically. So nicely separated and Depending on how you name things, um, it may also make sense. I quite often have projects, and within the project, I then have uh, a virtual environment that's specific to that project, so I can play around with it, not affecting anything else. And it's just virtual environments, sort of like to me, are actually things that get thrown out quite quickly or play around with and whatnot. So there's nothing really permanent um, for a developer, at least, and then only. If I'm actually installing things on uh, production systems, then I don't tend to touch that that much. So that's that um, with the VNF module. Um, I have rich length, and I can basically then do the same thing there. Use it in um, Python 3.8, for instance. Um, create, create that. Um, I can create one for 3.7 at the same time. I mean, virtual length also has other options still. Um, which can be quite useful. So I actually have to make that a bit smaller. So you can, for instance, say no pip, no setup tools, no wheel. Um, you can require a certain version of pip, version, certain versions of setup tools, um, and then don't download things. Um, one thing that was quite handy is rather than sim linking, so this is one, that's one thing I've experienced sometimes when the operating system updates things, um, um, it's, it's handy if you actually copy use copies rather than sim links in your virtual environment so things don't disappear but by default it uses sim links um, and one thing dun, 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 where is it? yeah we'll just leave it at that so we have um, Virtual environment seven freeze nothing in there, so we can install the same thing again. 
NumPy Yeah, same thing as with VN, so not much of a difference, so that'll all do. So, I mean, I can easily, um, actually, let's just import. Cool, right, so I can, um, yeah, so NumPy works. Um, and I can actually do things with it. And NumPy is really a good candidate for breaking things all the time. So, making sure what version you're running with, but it's something we're going to talk about later a little bit. All right. Anaconda is, I'm going to show that, rather than Linux, I'm going to show that actually on um, my Windows box here, another virtual environment. So, I actually fell into a trap which I didn't know existed even. Oops. Yeah. That's not what I wanted. Yeah. Right. It looks like the share clipboard is not quite working as expected. Oh, well. We'll live with that. Um, right. Okay. Right, we're here now. So there's an Anaconda. There's two versions of the Conda program, and I don't know why there's two in there. So it, it, it's a little bit confusing. And I used the wrong one, and I had problems with it. So um, I can do Conda help. And then you can see a lot of things. So you can do clean, compare, create. That's what we want to do. Um, Come my list help. So if I want to, I can list things. So what does come the list do by itself? It takes a while. Whatever it's doing. Oh, yeah, so that's sort of like all the things that it has already installed, the default thing, right? Oops. We're going to create a virtual environment. Let's use um, Python 3.8 or the Conda 3.8. Yeah, so you can see it installs a few things, it even installs SQLite, and it also uses uh, Visuals, um, Visual Studio 2015 runtime, and uh, it looks like maybe a Visual C compiler, compiler. so installing all that. Ta -dum, ta -dum. Takes a little while. Okay, let me follow instructions. Conda activate Conda 3.8. Oh. We can do a pip freeze there. So we have a little bit more in there. So we can do a Conda um, install NumPy. You can see it installs all kinds of other things as well, like for numeric stuff behind the scenes. So like MKLs, a Intel library, for numeric, I think, matrix stuff related things. Oh, okay, so if we're doing a pip freeze now, there are a whole lot more in there already. But I can once again start up my Python and then put NumPy. Um, and it works. 
always forget it's control Z, not control D in Windows. Yeah, so um, same thing. Um, yep, yeah. once again, um, outside with Conda deactivate, so really no brainer. It's quite easy to use. Um, I'm gonna quickly go into. Right. Um, so I can, in theory, create. Now looking at the time, um, I can create a virtual environment here as well. So what I um, already oops, did uh, did a pip install virtual env earlier which gave me in the scripts directory a virtual env command. So I can now basically create virtual environments using Python 3.10 because it's once again limited to a particular version that I'm under. So I can then create a virtual environment. Um, I'm just going to have a look. I don't know if I want so, um, just going to have a look what I have to do here. Probably don't have to use the minus p anymore, so I can just have the destination. So, it knows which uh, Python interpreter to use. So, I can then have um, Tim and then virtual length. 3.8, oh sorry, 3.10, in this case, cool, and now we have a virtual env directory there, and if we um, go on there, um, scripts, I uh, scripts I believe, yep, um, I have to use the batch file. Yep, I have to use the batch file. So I can then go anywhere and then ask for a version of Python I have 3.10.4. Um, pick freeze, what do we have? This is always a little bit slow, nothing in there. So we can once again install NumPy in there. Oh, yeah, well. Call. Only NumPy there, and you can see that once it gets, you can see it's actually not compiling anything. Anything, it's installing a wheel file, so quite good. So I didn't actually have to deal with any of that. One thing where um, I didn't basically just wanted to test my build environment where I can't actually build anything. So pip install, you can supply the no binary um, option and you can list then what libraries you don't want to have um, downloaded as weird files or binary, but only from source. And then, so in this case, we have oops, PyYaml and PyYaml twice in there because we want to install PyYaml, but ensure that PyYaml doesn't get installed as binary. So I'm going to install that. So in theory, it should download that. I tried it earlier, so it's using the cached version of the sources. Installs the build dependencies. And depending on how, how many dependencies you have, it might, can sometimes be uh, time for a cup of tea. All right, that wasn't too bad. Yeah, and now we have NumPy and PyAmo. Great. So, um, if I start up Python, um, oops, it's just YAML you know, here. Yeah. Um,
Just create a dictionary quickly. Yep, and then um, I think maybe it's that. Uh, yep, there we go. So we can dump that out as a more string. I think. Anyway, um, so things work. That's the main thing. Cool, and then I can deactivate that, and we're out. So that wasn't too bad. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen again. Just a few more things to consider when actually dealing with virtual environments. Dependencies. Any programming language or operating system or whatever has something that's called a dependency hell. Some versions work, some versions won't work, and um, trying to marry all of them up so that you actually get a coherent system can be sometimes a nightmare. And sometimes when you want to install a new version of one library, you have to sort of like kick out something else and then discard some functionality. But unfortunately, that's how software development happens at the moment. Um, new functionality gets added, other things disappear. It's always in flux. So when you do pip install numpy, it basically installs the latest version that may or may not work. Um, for instance, what worked tonight's, at tonight's talk may not work next year and so on. So what's important um, is actually, I mean, something that I've been using coming from the Java world, you always specify what exact version usually of the libraries that you're using so you know it's definitely working. Um, sometimes you can use ranges if you know that people follow sort of like the um, major release, minor release and patch release uh, philosophy, but a lot of people don't so it's quite often a gamble if you do that. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you can have a some specific versions that you know definitely work within there as well. So one thing that's recommended, once you've configured basically a virtual environment, your code works and everything is dandy, do a pip freeze and redirect it into a requirements.txt file. So that requirements.txt file is de facto standard for storing requirements with a version. And um, the great thing about this text file is also you can then also put that under version control. So next time you check out the particular source code of your, li of your library or program, you can just basically recreate that virtu a virtual environment using um, pip install minus r for requirements txt file. And it basically reads things from there. And off you go. Um, can still be problematic if you're using a different Python interpreter. Um, for instance, switching from Python 3.5 to Python 3.10 or whatnot um, due to certain changes in, in Python itself because there's always some niggly bits that break things. I've experienced that over the years, despite the biggest break being between 2.7 and 3, but there are still things happening. But at least um, with, that gives a good indication for people what actually was being used with. Um, one thing that I've found always very uh, frustrating when you're looking at online tutorials of other libraries that you need to use, and all they're doing is a pip install with no version. And you look at, hmm, when was that, po when was that post? Hmm, two years ago. <sighs> Do I want to be a detective and figure out what version was current at the time of writing of that article or not? So sometimes you just try and then after a while, sometimes you just give up because there's just so many dependencies that have changed. And especially if you have things like in the deep learning world, um, that there are so many dependencies that you just have no clue what's actually going to be necessary. So sometimes you just give up. So yeah, do your readers and um, users do a favor, do them a favor and uh, produce a requirements TXT file. Some other tools that um, can be used 
um, around dependency management, similar to PIP. One is called Python Poetry, and according to them, it's a um, Python dependency management tool and for packaging, and it allows you to clear, declare various libraries for your project, and it will manage them for you. Um, I haven't used it, it's just, it's sounded like an interesting uh, project, um, like most of them. <laughs> Pipex, um, they want, it's really sort of like specific for application installation, and they create an isolated environment for each application um, to make sure that there's no interference with them. So similar to what you're doing with your individual virtual environments. Another one was pipinf, um, and they are trying to bring the best of all packaging worlds together to the Python world, and that might be maybe something that you want to look into if you're on Windows and you don't use, and or don't want to use Anaconda, um, you could look at using pipinf and see what can be done there, uh, whether that actually helps with um, installation and compilation in there as well. So I haven't looked into it, but somebody else wants to talk about that another time, or all the, all the other tools that I wasn't been, haven't been able to touch on, then feel free and contact me. Um, it will be very interesting to see how that compares to the other ones that have been around for a lot longer. Yeah. Now it's all good that you've installed and developed something, but you also have to maintain it, and that's usually where most of the time goes in you have to look into are there vulnerabilities and things like that. So if you're developing on GitHub, um, there's, I have this Depender bot, which now for a few years now, it's been around that actually um, can give you a, like a weekly summary of vulnerabilities in your various projects and what to do. And it's quite handy, then you can basically upgrade things and whatnot. And that's one thing that um, David pointed out the other week to me, that there's also, of course, a Python tool that can look at um, the versions of the various libraries that you have installed in your virtual environment and see whether they're actually safe or whether there's some particular um, vulnerabilities known. So it's called safety, funnily enough. So if I... Um, I'm just going to go on to the next. So it's quite simple to how to use that. I can also show it li live in a minute. So you can basically create a virtual environment, um, <clears throat> knowing that all the versions of Django are riddled with holes. Um, you can install a Django version, like from an older version, like from the 1.x branch. Also install safety basically in that environment, and then just by calling safety, you can then output a brief report in text form for that particular environment, which looks a little bit like that. So you have a big <laughs> logo on top, and it checked 17 pictures um, using a free database, which only gets updated once a month. But I think for a lot of projects, it's probably sufficient. Um, if you are a business or if you're relying um, on mission critical things that it might be worthwhile paying for that uh, particular service. And then you can see um, sort of like, I've got installed 1.11.29 of Django and there are certain sort of like um, vulnerability ticket IDs attached. Doesn't tell you much in that brief report what's actually happening. So you can also run um, a full report and then it basically gives you for each of those vulnerability reports um, an explanation actually what's happening. So blah, blah, blah has a potential directory traversal via that particular uh, plugin and um, staff members could use sort of like this to check the existence of arbitrary files, which is not really something that you want. So looking basically through these uh, vulnerability reports can be actually quite useful to see whether there's something that you need to act upon or not. Sometimes the way you use a library might not actually be relevant, but nonetheless, you want to have a safe system after all. Cool. I'm just going to share my screen again.
and I can show that live as well. Okay. So if I oh, using that. um unsafe. We call it unsafe. Okay, unsafe pip install. I'm just gonna install Django. We're just Doing an old version Oops. here. I can install safety as well. There's a few more dependencies now. So if we are looking at pip freeze. You can see the Django 11129 is. And if I now call the safety one, oops, yep. I want to perform a check. And it's the same one we've seen earlier. Oh, that's actually a new one. Didn't see that one. So that's actually using an uh, effect something pip. So that's quite good to see. Um, there's you can have various versions whether you want to have a output in JSON or just text and you want to have a full report here. This to do. All right. So that's a bit longer then. So okay, pip. That um, nice thing they also give you basically a CVE report. So you could um, always just look that up. Flow is found Python, Python pip, and the way it handled Unicode separators and Git references. I think, okay. That's sort of like always a problem if a tool can do a lot like pip, like installing from Git repos and all kinds of things. Things unfortunately happen. But that's, uh, for instance, here pip updates its Euro Lab 3 um, and whatnot. So quite handy to browse and look through, and then you can. If there's um, CVE numbers, and you can always look into a bit more detail in as well. Okay. That concludes then my presentation for tonight. Thank you for listening and any questions. You're welcome, Jules. I used I used Anaconda mm. quite some time ago. Yeah. I, f I found two things. One was that the Python version wasn't very up to date. Oh, really? And I remember somebody complaining that Python three point one zero wasn't available in mm. Anaconda. Oh, interesting. Came available, or indeed, if it is available. Um, the second thing I noted was that some of the better packages, shall we say, um, one had to be a subscriber, so they were expecting some money before you could oh, download. Oh, really? Them. I haven't I encountered that so far. Yeah. I don't know if it's true today, Peter. Mm. Yeah, I noticed that that it had it, at some stage for some of the package that I was using, it had really really old version and it wasn't really updating anything, despite there being numerous sort of like releases since what they had. But it has improved over the years, and also for the free oh. channel. I'm not sure whether they just um, tried to get more people on board and then sucked into into that ecosystem. But um, if you have several gigs to start off just to write a little Python program, that seems like a massive overkill always to me. I mean, Python by itself is in the tens of megabytes, I think, when you install it. So that's not really big. 
and you can just quickly get going and write something rather than installing this monstrosity. But depending on what libraries you use and if you can't compile them and you, if you rely, have to rely on those channels, then that might be still the best option. But I usually try to avoid it. <laughs> Now, is the, you, you're talking about Anaconda or Conda, sorry. Um, Ana, well, Conda, well, Anaconda, sorry. Yep. Yeah, Anaconda, sort of like yep. their tool is Conda, and then quite often yep. they just call it Conda. Um, Anaconda is actually a company, and mm -hmm. they have different products, but everyone associates basically Anaconda and Conda with them nowadays. Yeah. So. Yeah, I used to use it like uh, a while ago, for, but mainly for um sort of data science stuff because it had mm. all things installed and and i was using it in windows yeah and it was in the setup. yeah and i mean that's how i started out as well because mm. it was simply easier <laughs> it's just when you realize how bad windows is for development <laughs> there was another package wasn't there like mini condor or something which was like a miniaturized version or something mini condo is available yeah yeah um not sure. same yeah i think i'm not sure whether it's also from in a from the inner condo guys as well um but yeah mm. but still it's it always i mean coming from linux and you have to do something on windows it was great finding something that then just works which you're just used to from linux with your distros and whatnot it just you install things and it's there and it works and just having a built environment on the command line is just so much easier for doing anything and then you just realize that windows was always aimed at like gui development tools and i mean i still uh, come from those days when we had batch files where we're actually compiling stuff with command line compilers and whatnot and then I left Windows development and then just coming back to and then with Python and seeing how terrible that actually can be it's like oh dear I don't ever want to use that really but yeah batch files eh yeah yeah oh, I love those things <laughs> <laughs> yeah it goes back a long time hmm. yeah but yeah no oh. Any more questions? Yeah, okay. sorry, I, I had to take a call. Uh, may have missed something that uh, no. Jules was saying. Um, with with some of these modern IDEs, so PyCharm and I think, uh, Codium, they they have. <laughs> I love the heat break. I warned Ian about that. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Okay. Take Ian out. We'll decide what to do with him later. Um, right. Uh, yes. Yeah, so modern IDEs like PyCharm, probably Codium, I think they have an ability to to um, put things into a walled garden like a like a virtual environment. Yes. I haven't I, I haven't used it. But, yeah. but is that correct? Is anybody yes. using one of those? Yeah. I use PyCharm, and you can create either virtual environments from scratch uh, for your projects, or it, you can tell it to use an existing one. And then it also finds if you're um, changing your requirements txt file or your setup.py file and you add a new um, dependency to it, it will basically pop up, hey, would you like to install that now? Um, so that can help sort of like newbies, but it's not so much what I really do, I usually manage my virtual environments usually through a terminal um, so that everything works outside an IDE but yeah it's, it definitely helps I think newbies and I think those IDEs are more aimed at, at people that do things outside IDEs as well so they understand that concept that not everything happens in the IDE Wash your mouth out with soap. What a thing to say. What? Yes, you're right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'd be I'd be interested whether you can do things like uh, freeze to requirements.txt, for example.
Well, it's just not much point in doing it because uh, you, you're uh, you're stuck with the IDE, aren't you? you... <clears throat> um, yeah, I've never looked into it because I don't use it that way. That's sort of like not my workflow in that sense. So um, I'm not sure where it's a full round trip. Um, I mean, sometimes I vaguely remember that if you're trying to import a library and it's actually not currently installed, they sometimes also offer, oh, would you like to add that as a dependency to your project as well? But I mean, that depends on if it's more sort of like of a well-known library rather than some random one that it has never come across before. So that can make things a little bit easier as well. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Peter, so yeah. all of my volumes. Yep, about right. Good. Um, yeah, I, I see that we're up to Python 3.10.4 is the current release. Yeah. So on your system now, if you want to test out, you know, some, let's say you've read of a new feature and you, and you want to check out how it works or something. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you know, your system by default is running what Python 3.8 or something. Yeah. Yeah. So you create a virtual, you'd use the virtual ENV one, would you? Or you um, have you got a download 3.10.4? You mean on Windows or on Linux? On Linux. So on Linux, um, I would probably use the Dead, Dead Snake <laughs> um, PPA oh. to install up um, Python 3.10 then. Um, let me have a quick look. Uh, yeah, I don't have 310 because I'm running an older version of uh, Mint. And uh, that Dead Snakes thing would be quite good to be able to get it from there. 23. Oh, yeah, it's 3.11 already. Oh, Ian, you're cracking up a bit. So it's fairly new. Well, it's less three oh, weeks 3 ago. 3.11 is also available. Um, Too loud. No, yeah, it was just... Uh, d -d 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 -d. You were stuttering a bit. Um, Okay. You're not on Starlink, are you, Ian? <laughs> no. So this yeah. is the, um, I've just posted in the chat, this is the um, Ubuntu PPA that I use mm. for my Python versions. And it, that's quite handy if you just want to um, test newer versions whether your code base still works or it's just a really broad range which I really really like and I mean it seems to have Python 2.3, 4, 5, 6 um, funnily enough not 2.7 um, Python 3 it has 3.2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11 I mean, it depends a little bit on your base system, what's available. Um, but yeah, so on Bionic, you can run certain things and Focal is a little bit different. But yeah, oh, I think it's great. I came across that a while ago just by chance and I thought, Dead Snakes, that sounds a bit weird. But um, it turned out to be extremely useful and that's what everyone sort of like is only referring to if you want to have sort of like up to date versions of Python rather than um, what your distro offers, go for that. Yeah, I just added it now. <laughs> <laughs> no guarantees that nothing works. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's actually good to be able to play with that later version because I actually had something in one of the, in the, like a user Python uh, app. It's um, mm -hmm. YouTube, the YouTube downloader that uh, yeah. they, they um, the old one died and yeah. uh, was really maintaining it. And the new one had some weird stuff that it wouldn't work on my one. And I think, and it was because there was some mm -hmm. subtle difference between 3.8 and I think they're using 3.9. Yes. Yeah. I don't yeah. have that. <laughs> Not yet. There you go. Problem solved now. 
Yeah, although I'm probably going to move to Arch soon anyway, so bye-bye yeah, yeah. and Ubuntu and all those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think but still it's good having sort of like um, if you have to rely back on to Ubuntu that you have at least one way of installing different versions. Mm. Cool. Yeah, I read somewhere that um, I think it's after 3.9, um, Python supports curly braces. Um, I haven't curly. seen the code examples. <laughs> and, um, that's why I was you mean rather about than a... four blanks as indentation? Something like that, yeah. Really? Yeah, you can use curly braces Excellent. if you're a curly braces person. <laughs> All right. I'm going to change my code now. <laughs> <laughs> Python with moustaches. The moustache, eh? Yeah. Woo. <laughs> yeah, better than I know, it's true. That's why I was wondering about downloading a new version. Was that an April right. Fool's joke? Did you read that? Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> All right, I'll have to do, unfortunately, something else tonight. So, um, cool. I just want to thank everyone for um, coming tonight. Well, it was great having you guys. May I interject with an advert, please, Pete? Oh, yes, sorry. Yes, please, David. Go ahead. Um, right. I've just posted in the chat a link to the uh, Orcpug uh, meeting, which is on Wednesday evening. And it'll be uh, Tom Clark, who is the president of NZ Pug, coming for a, a, a well, I suppose he's going to give us a talk and then coming for a Q&A. So it's uh, mm. our opportunity what's going on in Wellington um, and also what's going on at the national level because most of us will be aware that uh, the the uh, Kiwi PyCon has been delayed what two or is it three times now courtesy of COVID at least um, twice yeah yeah so I can't remember whether it's three um, anyway uh, so yeah uh, an opportunity to find out what's happening at the national level if you are not as plugged in as Peter is and um, an opportunity to ask questions so uh, if you'd like to come along um, these days we, we we don't worry too much about geography and uh, <laughs> perhaps, we should, perhaps we should get rid of that label which says Auckland because that turns a lot of people off straight away doesn't it uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. but it'll be a virtual meeting in case that wasn't obvious um, yeah. so yeah all welcome thank uh, you Pete. we just say north of Bombay Hills or <laughs> Well, um, yeah, I, I was going to go for UTC 13, but um, oh, right. that, 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 that would be wrong for six months of the year. But, um, we, yeah, we did have a suggestion of UTC Max. You can't get much more Max from UTC than we are. True, yeah, that's correct. Um, yeah. But, but, yes, because we... Um, <laughs> because we have... We have been working at this, and we have uh, regularly people from all around the Pacific Rim. So people mm. in the States uh, and South America. We have people in Australia and uh, in the islands. So um, we're, mm. we're, we're enjoying a much wider uh, spread, but also we're bringing in speakers from all over the world as well. So we're, we're getting a, um, a bit of a reputation, I suppose, for being ch yeah. We're also getting a bit of a reputation for hearing from all sorts of different people. So, uh, yeah, um, everybody welcome and uh, just try and ignore the Auckland label until we can get rid of it. <laughs> That's all good. Thank you very much for hey, that. David, guys. are your meetings always at 6.30? Um, yeah. Morning? Yes. Yeah. I'm a, a bit early uh, for me. No, he's still eating. Yeah, That's all. Well, anyway. well hmm. Ian, Ian, if you turn your microphone off, nobody will notice. <laughs> True. Right. If if your microphone's off, nobody can hear the the um tom, the tom, tom. tree the tree falling in the woods. Yes. Um, I think his wife might notice that <laughs> he's not paying attention to what she's saying at the dinner table. Yeah, I, I think it's tradition, Ian, that, that the meeting's been 6.30. Um, it suits people when they're meeting in person. It suited people who were working in the CBD. Mm -hmm. um, time time to finish work, get across town, wherever they had to go. Uh, grab, oh, grab yeah, a without going home. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, going home first yeah. and coming back. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's yeah. it's different from Hamilton, where it's a lot easier to get around, particularly outside mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, peak hours. You know, Auck Auckland's mm -hmm. very spread out compared to Hamilton. Yeah. Well, Hamilton has no reputation of having sh uh, terrible traffic too. So, oh, you're kidding me! You're kidding me! All those motorways. You, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You go, go back to when I was a boy. It took forever to get around Hamilton. At, 30 miles an hour? No, actually, <laughs> all those years ago when I came to Hamilton, it was like uh, everything was dead at 5 p.m. and you could actually drive. And now it's a little bit different. So it's really stuck in mornings and evenings now and a lot of That's... traffic during the day now as well. But I thought it was just both still still in their old cars. <laughs> mm. Everyone's no, on the wrong side of the river and living on the other side. Mm. And the kids are stop the recording. Yeah, it's all right. It's all good. Um, they can be always uh, pruned at the end. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. Maybe. I mean, that's one thing you can definitely inquire then uh, on Wednesday, sort of like whether they actually, whether there is actually now a volunteer for actually um, post processing those videos and maintaining a video channel of those meetups. Uh, yeah, um, that's one of the things I've got uh, on my. Yeah. Ever lengthening list of questions to ask, yeah. Uh, yeah. but um, but as you know, I mean, you and I have been agitating on this. Yeah, uh, just one tip, sort of like don't agitate too much, otherwise they'll ignore you. I think they already do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Um, on, on which subject, Peter? The there was a fellow who was asking on the NZ Pug mailing list. Yes. Um, whether we wanted to hold a sort of a virtual conference, virtual PyCon. Yes, yeah. Did, did anything ever come of that? Because once again, it, it reply just disappeared into cyberspace and nothing I came back. It was mainly about collecting and whether people also maybe co um, contacted him off list as well, potentially. Um, I'm no longer on the committee, so I'm not really involved with that anymore. Um, right. So from that point of view, I'm no longer as keyed up as you have made me out to be. Um, you know uh, everything, Peter. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's probably still, as far as I know, still going ahead. Um, but it's the usual problem finding speakers, basically. Um, and I think that's um, the question whether they... I mean, personally, I would just say how they could just ask the meetups whether they would want to ask their speakers from the past whether they want to sort of like re-give a talk um, and represent something, and so that something's actually happening. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's not supposed to be too much of a competition with Kiwi PyCon. Um, it's more like yeah, let's let's do something nice and little. That's not not necessarily too much effort to organize and just to get people together online. So, fingers crossed that it's still going ahead. Well, strangely enough, that's what you've been doing this evening, getting people together. Yeah, I mean, that's what the meetups are there for, right? But that exactly. would be sort of like at a national level then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but there's absolutely nothing to stop somebody coming in from Christchurch. No, um, but I think tonight. Huh? it might maybe having a broader range sort of like of talks and whatnot might actually people might consider rather than going to a particular meetup they might actually maybe get time off from work to and consider that as sort of like personal development time um that yeah. they can do that so yeah. i think that's that's a little bit different because for a lot of people that's sort of like family time and whatnot in the evenings they don't actually have time for that so that's why recording things and making that available online is already great but um, if that's sort of like an online event, um, that could maybe go through like that or some other mm. Well, I hope I hope it happens. If mm. I hope it happens quite soon, because otherwise it will start to impact on PyCon. Yeah. So, well, see, yeah. I mean, it's something you can ask uh, Tom then as well. What's been happening there in that space? Will do. Cool. Thank All you right. very much. No worries. All right. All right. All right everyone thanks for coming again and everyone stay safe and we'll see what the next weeks bring in the world of Omicron and what is a new version called xe
or crossy or whatever. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Anyway, thanks everyone and good catch night. you later. Thank yeah, you, Peter. Peter. And I wish everybody a good night. Cheers, Danny. Hello.